Hi, and welcome to From the Research Chair, episode number 25. I am Jason Voss, and that is my co-host. Michael Falk. We are going to be talking about inflation today. Michael, uh, inflation has been on the tips of the tongues of what percentage of our clients in the last two years? I'm going to estimate at 100%. I think that that is correct. Um, so let's. Oh, I should drop off now. I got I got a question right. Oh, it, <laughs> exactly. Quit while you're ahead. Um, so we had on our outline how to warranty inflation. That was your ask to be on the agenda. What the heck do you mean by that? Well, when we look through history, I'm so sorry to try and bring data into this topic. Go back to 1800. Yeah, I do mean history. Deflation has been the historical norm, period. Not arguable. If we take the accident, some of us refer to as the 1970s in the US, out of the data set, the number of years where inflation, calendar years, where inflation has been calculated greater than 3%, has been single digit percentage of the years. Deflation's a historical norm. Why? Simple. As time has gone by, our ability to produce goods has grown exponentially. Faster than the number of people has grown. This- so there are three main things maybe four that warranty inflation. Are you ready? I'm taking notes. Technological advancement. Ding, ding, ding. Well, we got lots of that. We can argue good or bad, but we have lots of it nonetheless. Okay, number two, uh, debt. The amount of debt in a society, higher levels of debt is deflationary. Okay, let's go to number three, demographics, agedness. The older that societies have been on average tends to lean towards deflation. Why? Because older individuals consume less historically. I'm not making a prediction now. I'm talking about warranting inflation that we've seen. The last thing, globalization. Which was your maybe thing. Yeah, globalization. Globalization has pushed towards the economic law of comparative advantage. I'm so sorry. I brought a textbook into this. Forgive me. Law of comparative advantage. Or simply the law of no OSHA. Ha ha. All right. This is the fact that in different parts of the world, labor is less expensive. Safety issues in workplaces are less expensive. And we have established incredible supply chains over the last 20 years. And we have partnered with other countries for production. So those four things warranty inflation. We can examine each of those and ask, what is the direction of those today to get some insight into the things that actually support inflation. Jason, that is my story on point number one. Happy to take questions or go deeper. No, 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 no. I, I want to interject. I did an article for my personal blog two years ago, I think. Lost track of time, uh, which was why is the equity risk premium uh, been so, why was it negative for so long? Uh, And you highlighted uh, a unique phenomenon, the 1970s, which has not really been repeated. But what I've also come to- Thankfully. Yeah. And what I've come to appreciate is that there's another side to that story. Why were interest rates so high? And one thing, uh, and both sides of that pincer are informative relative to what you've just outlined. And you and I worked with a client last year for whom the long history of interest rates was especially important and relevant for their investment process. And we had outlined, I had outlined that there are three major epics 
epox e p o c h yeah let's let's make sure people understand the word yeah in in the long history of interest rates and we went back to like 1880 and the first and second epics the first epic was like 1881 to the great crash of 1929 and then from 1929 until mid 60s epic 2 epic 3 was mid 60s like 1965 i think it was september 65 all the way through until the dot com era the longest of the epics that is the only epic where we had high interest rates and the question is why why were interest rates so high why were equity risk premiums negative and some of what you've outlined uh is a reason um what you didn't have in there was and i'm no gold bug and not especially informed to talk about it but we went off the gold standard we went off of an asset-backed uh currency at one point in there i happen to think that probably had something to do with it as well, well and then i last absolutely bit, i agree I but 50 years ago, we want to talk about inflation going forward. We've been off the gold standard for half a century. No, I know we have. But then, but there was a dislocation caused as things reordered. And that's where I'm arguing it. The other thing we had in there was the globe, the global economy's most important commodity had for a brief moment of time, a consortium that agreed on what to do with the price of that commodity. And that was the most important input into almost every process. Said another way, we were very manufacturing oriented global economy circa 1973 with the OPEC oil embargo. And there are all kinds of problems that that caused. And I would argue it took you know, a good long while to unwind some of that rechain that systemic change in the way we did money supply and interest rates and all the interlinkages in them. So that's the part I wanted to add in there. But I think these two things are related to what you were outlining. I, I agree. And if you notice, the one thing I did not mention specifically was monetary policy. With all due respect to Uncle Milty, Milton Friedman, no, he's not my uncle. I just can't resist. <laughs> uh, inflation is everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, no, uh, if the velocity of money has fallen and can't get up. It's not the total aggregate money supply. It's the fluidity of the aggregate money supply. Now, it, with all due respect, I'm not sure these concepts were around when he was doing his influential work on the industry. I don't mean any disrespect. I mean, we have to add to the conversation. We can't simply accept that which we think we know. We have to continue to add, think, pursue more on these topics, become more learned if we can. And the velocity of money matters. My big concern, listen, demography, wonderfully long-term predictable. We're not going to stop or change that. Technology, we're not going to stop or change that. I apologize to all the Luddites. All right. Debt, well, unless Martians are going to come down and buy our debt, we have a debt overhang. We're not getting out from under anytime soon. So I'm left with globalization. This is my current concern. We can break this. We can break this if we're not careful. Supply chains have been damaged because of the pandemic. Countries have become more and more independent versus global as in the past. This is the one part of the inputs that I have the greatest concern about. But if you ask me what my level of concern is, it's not high. We can break this, but to do that, oh my, the things that have to happen, these supply chains are, have been built over 20, 30 years. They're not going away with ease. Yeah, and I'll add something in there that's a political thing. And we, we think of inflation as a purely economic phenomenon, but the political thing is that businesses and the US dollar act globally 
and in defiance Still. of any one, yeah, in defiance of any one government's ability to influence the outcome. And that has broad implications. So even the Fed can't solely manage the United States and its outcomes. My point is, is that because businesses act globally and they have influence on these and capital allocation happens across borders, it acts actually as another almost regulatory mechanism that has to be brought into the equation. Major companies do influence some of these outcomes um, and they shop around for lower cost jurisdictions and they created these supply chains and they will fight like mad a trade war behind the scenes. So the politicians, I have to say, have less power to influence than they might think. I agree with that. It makes me very happy, warms my heart even, that they may have less impact. But that doesn't mean they can't try and break things that are working. Now, when I say working, I want to be very careful. I want to be very respectful. When, when I say working, it doesn't mean it's working for everybody equally. It's working for some people but we are never working for everybody equally. Let me give you a simple example. And this was another one of the things on our tip sheet about our topics today. Let's just take food inflation for fun, okay? This is number four for people following along. This is inflation. Yeah, I'm, is I'm jumping perfect. ahead because I wanna be clear about working. Food inflation, if the cost of food doubles, we have to understand how that impacts different households. If you've got a household that is very high in the socioeconomic ladder, food may be 10% of their spending. All right, 50% jump, it goes to 15%. All right, easy math. If you've got somebody who is on the lower part of the socioeconomic ladder and food represents 20% of their household consumption, 50% increase to 30%, this is not good. This is not easily affordable. That's what I mean by working is not necessarily balanced across all individuals and households in a society. Inflation affects us all a little differently based upon our income and our consumption patterns. So, Let's go back to number two. There was a natural probably lead. appropriate. There's a natural lead in there. Supply push versus demand pull. I have data that I will share, but only here shortly. Uh, Michael, talk to us about that. Well, we used to think that it was too much money chasing too few goods. That would be demand pull. I think that we have shifted the era to supply push. And why, before Jason shares his data, why? Because we have shifted largely from a manufacturing-based economy to a service-based economy. Based upon that shift in the type of economy we have, it's got to be supply push because stuff seems to be less of a factor in the overall economic growth. Well, if that's the case, we have to be shifting from demand pull to supply push by definition, in my opinion, I'll own that statement. So what I'll add there, one of the more interesting things I've seen in my career, I'm now, I think in my 29th year, if I'm not mistaken, something scary like that. Oh, come on, come on. You're close to 30. I'm over 30. Yeah. Uh, Rick Reeder of BlackRock several years ago at a CFA Institute fixed income conference put up a chart that I was so envious uh, that he possessed the underlying data of, and he did not share the chart. Like we requested it and he didn't want to do it because BlackRock had spent a considerable amount of time and energy to develop it. And the chart showed well, actually, it recognized something philosophically at the high level, something that they chose to examine, which I'll reveal in a second. And then they actually had spent a good chunk of change trying to measure the following philosophical insight. And that is that inflation, the things that we use to track it are denominated in a currency, and but that's not the only part of the equation. There's also a volume story 
to inflation, which remains hidden because we don't measure inflation in terms of units produced or manufactured or software downloads or those types of things. We just do it on price. And if we don't consider the unit story, we're missing a huge amount of potentially deflationary forces. So BlackRock, and this was Rick Reader's chart that he had put up there, essentially they had researched what has unit growth been globally for all kinds of goods and services. And what their data showed was their massive growth in units that were not captured in the inflation data. They Their actual price inflation they showed for what they were able to measure both price and volume for showed the classic result inflations around one to two percent per year but unit wise and i don't remember rick's numbers it was double digit deflationary pressures enter the following the united stuff. nations we got well, lots of stuff yeah but yeah we've got lots of stuff i'm now putting up on screen the united nations now publishes volume data for things manufactured or sold, including things like software downloads. And this is the G19. I don't remember which of the G20 I'm missing from this equation right here. What it shows is the overall uh, manufacturing output growth of different members of the G20. I also have the price uh, stuff in here as well. I'm going to scroll up a little bit. So this is the level of deflationary force interjected per year in percentage. So China in 2006, if you look at their volume growth versus their actual price uh, change, minus 6.72% and across the board. So this column right here, the average deflationary pressure, and this is measured in terms of global GDP, China alone, with the volume of things that is produced for lower and lower and lower and lower prices, is 9.37%. Not captured in inflation data. Saudi Arabia is interesting. They don't have, uh, they didn't start publishing data until recently. I say interesting only because, as we know, fuel as an input has been decreasing relative to bullet point one in our conversation today, where OPEC had an outsized effect, they've had an effect here, but only of 6% because oil prices have declined. Anyway, And they've lost this, control over the oil price as well. Correct. And you see India right here actually is, they've actually raised their prices relative to things. Anyway, the aggregate by year of deflation- Row 105. Row 105 is- right here. So other than 2009, which was a recovery from the Great Recession where prices probably were uh, ended up being raised, uh, was the only real exception here. We have deflationary forces. This is the amount that uh, of deflationary forces not captured in CPI. On average, per year, it's around a percent and a half. And this is dollar weighted based on uh, output from these G20 countries. The G20 makes up 80% of total economic output. So said another way, if you look at CPI, it would be one and a half percent lower if we looked at it on a volume basis, not a price basis. This is price. Oh, and, and so hello data. Oh, why not bring data into these dialogues versus conjecture? Good stuff, Jason. Thank you for that. All right, here's a pet peeve. People are talking about inflation this year, 2021. And oh my, it looks like it's going up quite a bit. Uh, can I just remind everybody, uh, 2020, we were all in lockdown. Hello? Coming up from what? Give me a three-year average. Don't tell me what's happened right here, right now. We're in recovery, hopefully. We look back and this is recovery. And so it's a little bit of a pet peeve. So when people say, hey, Michael, do you think we're headed towards inflation? My response is, dun, 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 maybe for a little bit. And my response would be, as I'm fond of saying, almost every investment uh, industry disagreement is a failure to make explicit your time horizon. Name your time horizon, let's say five years. Do you think that, that, so I'm going to ask you, Michael, in five years time on average, will we have inflation or deflation? Deflation, in my opinion. 
deflation of mine as well. And I think for the reasons that I've, I've just revealed. So then let's switch it. Yeah, let's, hold on. And ahead. just a little causation. If you wonder why central banks have been working so hard to push towards negative interest rates, for those who are not aware, and I think most of you probably are, but it needs to be stated for the record, deflation is a more pernicious risk for an economy than inflation. And central banks don't want it. Yeah, I agree. Difficult to manage for lots of reasons. But anyway, very difficult. Let, let's, That's why I said pernicious. Yeah, let's let's connect this conversation to where we almost went in bullet point one, uh, and that is as we're working with clients, many of whom have as investment philosophies some form or variation on fundamental analysis. Mm -hmm. Of that fundamental analysis, valuation plays in it. Is value investing need to get with the times or are we in living in such an anomalous period that their patience and waiting for things to return to normal is warranted? What's your thought? They need to get with the times. When, if we are producing more stuff with less input around the world, valuation started with book value. Uh, we've evolved. We, book is less important, if only because of IP, because of intangibles, because we're more of a service-based economy. So I strongly feel that value investing needs to evolve. It doesn't have to change completely. Just update yourself, please. I like value investors. These are good people. I know a lot of them, and I'm hoping they kind of update. Yeah, and let's let's refresh for those who are maybe new to the conversation. You and I had one of our podcast episodes about whether value versus growth was an even legitimate dis, uh, distinction. You and I concluded, no, it's not a legitimate distinction. It's a false distinction. It's really fundamental versus momentum. So mm -hmm. if you are a fundamental investor, please stop labeling yourself as a value investor. That should give you the existential wiggle room to begin looking at data, like I've just shared with you in terms of the deflationary force that's hidden there that you can't see, um, and then the capability of updating your methodologies so that you can begin allocating capital again, not necessarily using metrics that were hatched in the 1930s, which by the way, was also a peculiar time. Yeah, in which they didn't have a lot of data just for the record, because it was difficult, massively difficult to obtain. We can't say it's massively difficult anymore. Uh, Jason, when we, we reference uh, valuation versus momentum, okay, fundamental versus momentum, if you are a long-term investor where you have an objective of holding your investments for five, 10 years, maybe even longer, does valuation even come into the conversation? We, no. And we had that conversation on one of our podcasts as well. And it's one that we have with our clients that have ironclad valuation principles. When we actually examine the data, the accuracy of their valuation predictions, they're almost always off. And by- But they were brilliant at picking incredible businesses. Exactly. And their timing of these things relative to market vagaries of price is usually pretty terrible. And we, you and I considered the philosophical question, why would you even engage then in valuation? And we concluded you should engage in valuation. Do you remember what we concluded? Why you would engage in evaluation exercise? You just have to understand the business from my perspective. You have to understand the business from the perspective of their accounting. I, if I can just say that, and we, we can try and understand its, its strategy, its quality of leadership, its culture, its market position, its competitive position, its power over suppliers. Oh my, it sounds like Porter's Five Forces. Because it is. But you need to understand their accounting because you need to understand their ability to withstand shocks. 
So that was almost exactly what we had concluded. We said valuation is a valuable exercise because it's a lovely clearinghouse and framework for having discussions about the change in value, not valuation, but value in the business as a franchise or as an entity given different like variables that may affect the business. And we said, that's why you engage in a valuation exercise. It's not to be the be all and end all of your decision-making process. It's a convenient framework and arena, if you will, to begin to weigh the out possible outcomes of all these different things that may affect the business. So that's why valuation is important. So let's summarize where we've co- what we've covered so far. Um, are there reasons for uh, systemic reasons that would cause deflationary forces? Yes, check. The next thing we covered was, um, are we living in a really unusual time? Uh, relative to the long history and span? No, we are not. The anomaly was when most of the textbooks that we all relied upon when we were all educated in the 80s and 90s were written, and that's the framework that many of us have. We have inintentional blindness. We haven't looked at the long history stuff. The long history is deflation. Check. Three, are there other deflationary forces that are taking place that are not visible because inflation is thought of as a price phenomenon, not a volume phenomenon. Yes, check. Fourth thing we covered, are there other factors like demography and all these other things that would cause deflation? Yes, check. Next, I'd summarize all that because I think we're headed to another bullet point we haven't covered. If you disagree with us, and Michael, we're going we're gonna to try and play devil's advocate of our own line of thinking here. What would be the argument for things changing? The status quo. We're making a status quo argument that this is status quo and has been status quo, will continue to be status quo. This is not anomalous. What's the devil's advocate argument and can we make it? What would have to change? I think there would have to be massive policy error. Meaning politics would have to come into the economic world in a significant manner. And many countries around the world would have to engage in populist policies. And that would be the single biggest risk to the status quo, in my opinion. Because the other things I don't think change. The debt levels aren't going to change. Demography is not going to change. The arrow of technology is not going to change. This is the one thing that I think that is at risk. Now we have to assess then the likelihood, right? So that, let's uh, let me ask you a question that's uh, um, embedded in there. Can we imagine a Fed chair being allowed to continue to be Fed chair that would be advocate for raising interest rates to what the value, notice I say value because they don't self-identify necessarily as fundamental. They see themselves as not growth managers. The fundam- These value managers, if, if the Fed chair raised interest rates to that level that would then all of a sudden cause valuation to be normal, do we think that Fed chair would survive the political process? No, no. Yeah, I agree. I I just I think we're kind of stuck here. I don't I wish we weren't here because I my own personal opinion is that there's a little bit of a Ponzi scheme in terms of monetary policy. Uh, But (laughs) I don't think I don't think I cannot identify causal factors that were would cause this trajectory that we're on to change. Or, or change durably. So Jason, let's be, yeah. let's be, go Perfect. to the next level. Could it change? Yes. Not very likely. But if it changes, it's not likely to be a durable change because that Fed chair in that example would be thrown out on their behind. They would not be allowed to continue as soon as they could be kicked from that chair. Exactly. We would need a politician who has as a primary goal the depoliticization of monetary policy. Name that politician who thinks that way and who is electable. We have to, and this is the nature of the beast, and the beast, capital B, is a world in which it goes back to the normal that a value manager would prefer. We have to invoke 
the power extreme powers of imagination because there's nothing on the horizon there's no such politician there's no such fed chair there's no such uh inflationary force there's no <laughs> such deglobalization we have to we have to imagine extreme outcomes in order to get out of this non-normal period which you and i are arguing is normal yeah it's the status quo exists because the inertia is not great enough to move you from the status quo. Sorry, we'll bring a little physics into this. Uh, there's too much that is keeping us here. And there is too much that wants to keep us here. Oh, yeah. then you have to unmute Kate if you have a question. I did. I just unmuted. So uh, I, I, what I am interested in is not so much that we're on this long-term tra trajectory that does to me make sense what you're saying, but that the shorter term inflationary concerns that have come out of this, um, this strange period that we've been in the last year and a half, they do impact those um, price uh, factors that you've been talking about and that they're not necessarily, it's, it's unclear today how soon or how long it's going to take to unwind. And then you throw, it doesn't have to be necessarily a major policy error, but you could put in a potential lot of small policy er errors and you could see how this could get out of control and last maybe for, you know, ha have some impact over maybe a three to five year period before hopefully, you know, saner minds prevail. But, um, or, or we get whatever crazy um, pandemic is going on really under control, but we've lost, you know, the ability to produce more goods at lower prices, the, the supply chains are affected you know, we, we've already seen, as you were talking about the food issue. So, you know, just that demand pull is gonna, is, is having an impact. Um, so I, I'm just curious how you feel about talking about in that kind of time frame. Well, and first of all, Kate, thank you. Absolutely possible. We'd have to discuss how probable the, the real question you're asking, let's reframe it. If you've got a 10, 15, 20, 30 year investment horizon as an individual, I'm not talking about professionals now, three to five years qualifies as transitory, even if that happens. The biggest input that already is going to occur in the US that has impact here is the rise in the minimum wage, the mandated rise in the minimum wage. As that comes on, by definition, people have a little more money. You would expect these individuals to spend a good portion of that money by nature of the fact that minimum wage compared to lifestyle. So again, what I'm watching is velocity. I'm watching what are the characteristics of the velocity of the supply, money supply, to give me a little more insight into what the risks may be or may become. Kate, I can't say it won't happen, uh, but I still consider that period of time transitory within the horizon of most investors. And, and um, I'm, I just want to add to that, you know, it's, it's often great to say we're investing for 20 years. Um, um, having, having been now in the business for, um, you know, coming on to 40, uh, you know, it can make some sense. But the reality is when you're dealing with clients, whether they're individuals, institutions, or what have you, um, three to five years is often what they're looking at. So three, you, let's be honest, two to three. <laughs> two and to three, you know what you, you know. both just did? You made the endowment model a lie. Ha ha. They don't really have a long term. It's a lie. Well, oh, Michael, and, don't digress. 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, so I'm, I'm just sort of saying that that, that is, um, you know, sort of coming up to something. I mean, I mean, I like to talk about if you're a fund fundamental investor and you're, you know, um, trying to uh, push a stock and, it, and in the short term, it goes down 50%, you know, you've probably lost your job, <laughs> you know. And before, before it goes up in quadruples, you know, I mean, it, it's so it's that kind of um, issue, you know, sometimes. And, and are there, is it more important to just sort of explain to your um, client base how these long term projections are, uh, you know, really work in their favor versus? you know, what might happen over the next three to five years and what are we doing about that? Kate, before yeah. you ask another question, um, I want to answer your, your first one with um, a practical response. Having held the chair, I, I would, I, the time horizon issue, uh, you are, I think you're correct that that doesn't necessarily, that's not salve to the wounded consultant or investment intermediary. So the way I attempted to front run those issues as a fund manager was for every company, uh, and I looked at risk in my portfolio in a very unique way. I'm not uh, going to say how that was because that's part of my bread and bu butter as a consultant. But one of the questions I asked that was part of my risk management uh, was, is the company I'm looking at a price maker or a price taker, right? Price makers, are not going to be affected by this. And I tried not to have price takers in my portfolio. Said another way, uh, it's all too tempting if you've, not you personally, uh, but as an investor, if you label yourself as value, to only think valuation matters. A fundamental factor that is a moat factor is are you a price taker or maker? That's one. But then two, I had conversations with all of the management teams. And one of the questions I asked them was pricing power. And one of the ways to mitigate this is to ask each of your management teams before there's inflation, how are you thinking about managing this? One, you'll be better informed because there are a lot of brilliant minds uh, trying to solve that problem. They're on the front lines. They're even more at pressure than it, you are in dealing with investment consultants and trying to solve that problem. And I would not invest in companies that aren't thoughtful in that answer and that response. At the end of the day, because we're in secondary markets, most of us, we are slaves to the decisions of management. So I would want transparency into what the management teams are going to do. What, what we think, what Michael and I think is less important than what your top 10 largest holdings would do. And Jason, wonderful response. The only thing I wanna add is contained in this is pursue more information. Pursue more, why? Because as we pursue more information, we can move away from any cognitive dissonance we may have on the topic. As we pursue more data, we may remove more fear about the risk. And we can look at this not as inflation will happen or inflation won't happen, we can start to ask the question, what could cause it? What's the probability of it? And at the heart of that, it's just pursuing more information to have a better personal view that you can act on within the portfolio. Yeah, and I'll add another thing that I was patently aware of in my portfolio is what are the operating margins not the net margins, the operating margins of the businesses I am in. And I loved businesses that had greater than 40% operating margins. Uh, if below the operating margin line down to net income, they had a narrow margin. Either they had really steady operating margins like a grocery store so that they could lever themselves up or keep, charge really low prices. I didn't like those businesses though. Uh, I wanted fat operating margin businesses because of this very thing. Um, in an economic downturn, yeah, they'll be down 2%, but because of the operating leverage, they're not going to be down 100%. They're not going to dip into negative net margin territory. 
So that's another key factor um, is to be aware of that um, within your portfolio. Maybe begin to wait if you believe this is a truly risky thing. The last thing I'll point out, and I, I confess I'm a little bit naive about some of this stuff because as a fund manager, some might say it was lazy. I think in retrospect, it was a little lazy on my part, but nonetheless, I think it served me well. I tended to think of macro issues as having macro effect, meaning if the investment consultant is worried about inflation, if they can point me to the firm that won't be affected by it and I missed it, shame on me. But the fact is, is that that investment consultant probably has not got too many investment firms managing parts of their allocation that is dealt with inflation in such a phenomenal level that they can possibly criticize you uniquely. And that's a business level concern, but said another way, macro factors tend to affect everybody fairly macro level and equally. We had another podcast we did on scenario analysis, essentially. And to some extent, we brought that topic into this conversation. If we know the various inputs or things that can, can cause inflation, we can conduct scenario analysis to assess what we think the likelihood is. And again, we don't all have to agree. And the reason why is because the future hasn't happened yet. We don't know what is going to happen. So we each have to conduct our own thinking on these various scenarios. We wanted to bring these perspectives and these what we think are inputs and how the world maybe has shifted, maybe how it hasn't, to this conversation, because what the media is doing about the topic of inflation, I just think is a disservice. They're not giving people enough information. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, we're basically out of the remarks that we wanted to make. I, I want to summarize Michael, I think you and I are in agreement. We've talked offline about this multiple times because uh, we've had a number of managers ask us this question. I think Michael and I, if we could gift to our consulting clients uh, whose performances suffered a gift, it would be update your thinking. We're in 2021. We're one fifth of the way through a new century. And yet many of us were walking around with hundred year old models about what constitutes good value. Um, and I think recognize that investing in good businesses almost always makes you money. And there's lots of data that supports that research analysts are phenomenal pickers of great businesses and stop trying to pick the timing element based on valuation which takes care of a lot of the inflation stuff. Um, and then the second thing about inflation, I suppose I'd say is if you disagree with us and the, taking the devil's advocate view, that it's going to be a really big deal, present to us that scenario. We've heard them all and they all are imagining such extreme things as to then fall into the category of what has famously been said along the lines of, well, if the meteor hits, then valuation won't matter anyway. Uh, and my punchline to add to this is not using a meteor. If you look at the size of Gen Z and Gen Y, also known as the millennials, who are now at the oldest, 40, 40 millennials. Oh my God, I feel old. All right. The uh, percentage of the population the percentage of active spenders within the economy, they are taking up an ever bigger share. Uh, if, you, if I ask anyone, hey, do the millennials possibly think and behave differently than those of us who are older? And people will sometimes say, hell yeah, maybe not so nicely. All right, folks, it's different now. I can just say that. If they behave and think differently, number one, you can't rest on what you think is solid history. If they think and behave differently, and they are a massive, massive cohort, that's number one. Number two, 
make peace with the fact that they think and behave differently. They are actually good people. Take the time to get to know their values because they're going to be running the world. You may want to get to know them a little bit better. They're not evil. Let me interject something here. So I shared earlier the deflationary data, which I then with the UN information, I was thrilled to see the UN now publishes that. I was a, the data I shared was my data and my calculation. I've replicated Rick Reader's findings, basically massive deflation forces. That is one of the three most interesting stats I've ever seen in my career. Here's another one, and you bring it up, Michael. And we have a question from Kimberly. Kimberly, I want to acknowledge that I saw the question. We'll get to it in a second. One of the two, the second of the three most interesting data points I've ever seen is I did work for CFA Institute and I did demographic changes in terms of how they consume. And I calculate a marginal propensity to consume figure for the millennials, my generation, Gen X, uh, for baby boomers, and then we'll call them the World War II or greatest generation or whatever you want to call them. And for Gen X, for uh, baby boomers, and for the World War II generation, the marginal propensity to consume was essentially 96 cents on the dollar. So given an additional dollar of income, they would spend 96 cents. It's basically the inverse of the savings rate. They would say- Which is too low. Okay, keep going. You know what it, you know what it is for millennials and it had persisted over the span of data I had looked at? More. 88 cents was their marginal propensity to consume. Say it said another way, they, they save. save eight cents more. That is massively deflationary. And they are the largest generation in global history. And that is true in multiple places. I've even looked in Bangladesh and millennials. They're just not into, Michael's got a bunch of stuff on his shelves. I got a bunch of stuff on my shelf. I've got some useless pyramidical sculpture on my back deck here. Millennials just aren't into it they're not going to be consuming as much. And a lot of the economies there, so that's a deflationary force. Uh, Kimberly, you asked the question, uh, how is debt deflationary? I've got my own answer, but Michael, what's your, your answer there? Thank you for the question. When you have debt, you have a lower propensity to consume because you have a required debt service. You have more of your money that is paying for prior consumption and not expanding current consumption. That is my, the clearest, simplest answer I can attempt. You have to tell me if that's satisfactory or less so. But before you ask her that question, Kimberly, table your response for a second. My, I have a different take uh, than that. I acknowledge that that's true. I don't disagree with you. My answer would have been, if we were you know, having cocktails, would have been that it's deflationary in the sense that uh, at an interest rate level, given the massive debt overhang, name the Federal Reserve that will bankrupt her or his country by raising interest rates so that the refinancing rate of all of this debt that has been issued, all these blank checks have been issued, is now refinanced at way higher rates. They just won't do it. They can't do it. Um, and in that way, it's deflationary, at least on interest rates. Interest rates are going to be low for a long time. And Jason, is there not a story that I think we both have heard that if the U.S. Treasury were to have uh, rates rise to 3%, intermediate rates, uh, it would not be affordable for the country? I th yeah, I think that that's the stat I've seen too. Yeah. Uh, Kimberly, was that satisfactory? We have to check. Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it was really more um, on the, the federal debt level. Um, so the interest rate was directly to, to my question. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you for the question. Jason, do we have other questions or anybody else that would like to chime in in our last couple of minutes? I've not hey. seen other questions, but we do have Six minutes left, I believe. Kate waved her hand. Yeah, no, I was just going to add on to that last question, which was, um, uh, um, wait, hang on a second. Somebody just flashed something in front of me and it, I lost my train of thought. Oh, um, what about, just talking about the U.S. for a minute and, and inflation impact, 
what do you think the impact would be on the uh, millennials and Gen Xers um, if uh, the, the, the government actually um, ended the, the uh, school debt, the, the college debt. And, debt forgiveness. And yeah, debt forgiveness. Sorry, I'm 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 a, I got distracted here, and I couldn't put my words together. Well, you've got a cat what? on your keyboard. I know that could <laughs> cause issues. And that was a problem too. But um, yes. uh, anyway, that's that was the, you know since it's under discussion to forgive you know college and whatever university debt. So so all things being equal, that is the equivalent of stimulus. That is putting more money into the pockets of the millennials specifically because they are most affected in the U.S. of the student debt overhang. That could have an inflationary impact. The real question is, will it really unlock them? And here's what I mean by that. Uh, and this is a generalization. Please forgive me, everyone. All right. Too much debt for this generation has decreased household formation. It's decreased their purchases, uh, purchases of homes. It's decreased them starting families. So that's what I'm, when I say unlock them, that's what I'm thinking of as the lock. If that quote unquote forgiveness unlock them, that will definitely change some of the inflationary outlook, some of the inputs to this number. However, if it doesn't unlock them, purely transitory. So they'll buy another 70 inch TV and maybe an electric car and they'll be done. So here's, here's more data, right? So that same uh, comparison I did intergenerational, I looked at indebtedness level. The most indebted generation in US history is not the millennials. They have the highest student debt, but not the highest debt, it was Gen X. Gen X by far has the most debt in US history. Uh, but the reason why is because of what you've just alluded to, Michael, household debt. They've, they've mortgaged and they also have student loan debt that was high, but they also then have mortgages because their student loan debt wasn't as high. So and they still formed households. My prediction would be that millennials will substitute one form of debt for another um, so you might see a bump up in housing prices because there'll be a greater demand for that. By the way, I also know quite a few millennials just because my daughter's in that generation. And I know a lot of her friends, my wife and I, I, I consider it a compliment, have a couple of millennial couples that are friends of ours. And they've already substituted out. They've taken out home equity loans to get rid of the debt burden of student loans because the real burden for millennials is not the amount of the debt, the principle of the debt. It's that for whatever freaking reason, Sally May, the, the interest rate is not a market rate. It's mandated to be six and a quarter percent. And so if you're carrying the student debt, you're paying a lot more in interest payment than if you're using other forms of debt like a mortgage. And so the millennials that we know, and they're educated, they're college educated, they've taken out home equity loans to pay off their student loan debt. So they've substituted one form of debt for another to lower- And their lower their debt burden as a result. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think we'd see a substitute in the real estate is my prediction. But that would be bad for apartment prices. Apartment, if I'm a real estate investor in apartments, I would definitely be thinking about that. And we never have to talk about commercial real estate anymore, do we? I think that story is well cared for. Eh. So I think we're like, let's see, where are we? 1258 Eastern, 1158 Central, something 58, wherever you are, unless you're in India. Uh, any other questions? And if not, we will adjourn until two weeks from now. Have we properly treated the inflation topic? That's the only question I have for people. Um, one, one last question. You kept referring to like a, a presentation um, that 
Was there something sent? Or I, I never saw anything. Oh, no, no. This was a presentation I did for CFA Institute. It was called 21st Century Finance versus 20th Century Finance. Oh, oh I see. Because I love scenario planning. Uh, in fact, wrote a, uh, as a part of the investment idea generation guide, did a whole thing on scenario planning. But anyway, um, that presentation was meant to sort of jog the thinking of financial professionals who were complaining that they didn't understand millennials. And mm -hmm. so that data that I'm quoting comes from that presentation. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and I can send it to you. It's now dated a bit. I think I, last time I presented it with updated data was like mm -hmm. 2017, something like that, but I'd be happy mm -hmm. to send it to you. But we're yeah. still in the 21st century, so it should be good for a bit. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Jason, that'd be great. I'd love to see it. Okay. All right. I will see if I can find a copy of it uh, uh, and send it on to you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us today. All right. Well, thank thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we hope to join you in two weeks time. That'll be the 19th of August. It'll be episode 26. Thank you. If you have questions after the fact, you can email us. Frequently, you guys do. You won't ask the questions in this forum. Feel free to email us and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Looking Bye, forward to it all.